Well, first things first, we want to shout out our new subscribers. We have Frankie and Jen. Diane and my dad, Warren. Hi. (laughs) Andrea's dad's in the house. (laughs) Okay, I'm really, really excited to have you guys all join us. Yeah. I'm super excited about every time somebody hops on this joyride. Yes. Frankie, we love you. And she was at our live show. Mm -hmm. And I'm friends with her. And I adore her like in person. I know her personally. And it's just really cool to see names pop up people you know. Yeah. Now my dad. (laughs) I was, no, I was your like, dad. oh no, instantly I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> I, I send it to her and I'm like, isn't this your dad? <laughs> yeah, that was cute. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your support and welcome to Judgy After Dark. We have a lot of fun every Friday. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Thank you for joining. Yes. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Andrea. And I'm Claudia. And we're the Judgy Crime Girls. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining us. It's been a fun few weeks, for sure. Mm -hmm. Got to go to the haunted jail in Columbia City. Yeah. How was that? It was packed. Mm -mm. It was a lot of fun. And that building, supposedly, it's actually haunted. Okay. That's always cool. Did you experience anything? No. No. No, I didn't. No. No. It was very loud. There were a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But it was funny. It was a good time. Yeah. For sure. They have a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. So if you are a big fat loser and you can't make it through, (laughs) you um, have to go to the chicken coop. That's fun. Yeah. I love that. Definitely check that out. And I wanted to tell you that I started watching Peacock. Mm Mm-hmm. They have a series called Homicide for the Holidays. Uh Did you watch it? I haven't watched it, but I saw it on there. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Claudia brought our snack. We have facts and snacks. We start with the snacks. Mm -hmm. What did you bring? Well, they're like Italian cookies. They're chocolate and hazelnut amaretti. And they're just little cookies that almost... Uh, I don't know. They taste like they have amaretto in it. And they're just delicious. They are the cutest things ever because (laughs) even though they're cookies, they are wrapped like candies Mm -hmm. where the paper is twisted on both ends. You (laughs) did amazing. So listen, I have somewhat of a fact. I don't know how much of a fact this is to go with our snacks. But David Berkowitz, the serial killer known as Son of Sam, Mm -hmm. he was incarcerated in an upstate New York supermax prison when he predicted a murder and written off as just a made up story. Nobody listened to him until this exact prediction played out. So on the early morning of Halloween in 1981, While staying at their Manhattan home, 39-year-old Robert Sisman and 20-year-old Elizabeth Plutzman were beaten and shot to death. According to Reader's Digest, Berkowitz had described a cult carrying out this massacre and even described the exact apartment layout to a T. It is, however, unclear if Berkowitz's prediction was a coincidence. I don't know. To this day, though, the murders remain unsolved. Oh, my gosh. That's terrifying. I wonder if he knew someone on the outside Mm -hmm. or or was he in the same state? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So maybe he had somebody told him. I mean, that's weird that he would know exactly the layout of the apartment Mm -hmm. who would be murdered. Yeah, kind of creepy. That is creepy. Now, I've been doing a lot of research lately. So have you. But Mm -hmm. there have been 
several cases where, and this really, really happens, or supposedly where I've read the ghost comes back from being murdered, Mm -hmm. that person's ghost, and will tell like a family member, their mother or whoever, Mm -hmm. so-and-so killed me, and that's how the murder gets solved. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, creepy, amazing. Mind-blowing. I mean, there was one I read where she literally solved her own murder. Look, I believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. I do. It can happen. Yeah. And if someone murdered me, you betcha, I would be coming back to solve my own case. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, what you got for us today? Well, I have a haunted hotel for you today. Ooh, I'm already creeped out. Yeah, it's the mysterious murder and haunting of room 636. And did you know, actually, that San Antonio is one of the most haunted cities in America? No. Yeah. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So this is on the sixth floor, I'm assuming. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And... Well, and you know, a hotel would not be complete without a ghost story attached to its history, right? right? So in 1965, San Antonio's most mysterious and brutal murder took place inside one of the Sheraton Gunter's guest rooms. And since then, it appears that the remaining energy from that terrible night replace over and over (gasps) and over again. No. Leaving a paranormal imprint on the Sheraton Gunter Hotel that is certainly never asked for. The Gunter is like, dang it, people. So do they even rent out that room? Mm -hmm. (gasps) Yes, they do. And whether you believe in spirits or not, the story that haunts the Gunters past will hopefully pique your interest. I'm going to give you like a little bit of a backstory of the hotel, a little, I guess, maybe I don't want to call it a history lesson, but the current Sheraton Gunter Hotel was built in 1827, which was just a year after the fall of the Alamo. Uh-huh. And back then it was called the Settlement Inn, but some called it the Frontier Inn. When the Mexican cavalry swept into town to try and recapture the city of San Antonio in 1842, they were met with no luck. The Republic of Texas stood strong. (laughs) (laughs) Then the ownership changed, and for $500, the settlement or frontier inn was purchased and demolitioned in 1851. So Irish immigrant brothers William, John, and James Vance had visions for the settlement in times were changing, and they were itching to be part of that progress. The Vance brothers built a two-story building in place of the settlement inn and later rented it out to the U.S. Army for the next decade. And during that period, the property operated as the local headquarters for the U.S. Army. Oh, wow. Yeah. Then the Civil War broke out. Texas separated from the United States, like, you know, all the other southern states, and joined the Confederates. The Union, or the U.S. Army, parted from the headquarters base in San Antonio. They left, and by the time the Civil War ended, the property owned, in theory, by the Vance brothers had traded hands again. And this time, it was the federal troops who occupied the city and who also used the building as their headquarters. And they did so until 1872, when the property was finally given back to the Vance brothers. How gracious. Wonder how excited they were to be back in the hotel business. Right. (laughs) However, though, the timing was perfect. The first railroad tracks were put down in 1877, and for just a nickel, guests could hop into a carriage at the train station and right to the Vance house. Oh, funny. And for a whooping $2 a day, which was more than many people's wages at the time, guests could stay the night. Oh, well. That was luxury at its finest. I guess. So in 1886 was the dawn of a new day. Although the property continued to be owned by the Vance family, two German immigrants. Oh, my God. I knew it. (laughs) I knew it. Okay. 
You know I can't. I know. So two German immigrants had a new vision, and they took over management of the property. If you're new to the <laughs> Crime Girls, Claudia always slides in a German because she's German. Yeah, if I don't cover a case from Germany or involving a German, I will find <laughs> a German somewhere along the way. It's <laughs> true. So... Ludwig Manke and Lesher Trexler were a business team made in heaven. They worked beautifully together. Manke was conscious of that old world allure when it came to managing successful hotels. And Trexler, on the other hand, had a resume of being an excellent hotelier. And he was more than capable in convincing local cattlemen, ranchers, businessmen to stay at the new Manke Hotel. So not long after, however, Dreams aspired to make an even larger hotel on the site of the Vans property. And so they did. In the early 1900s, a group of investors came together to form the San Antonio Hotel Company. And there were 13 men in total, including rancher Jot Gunter, whose name would later be given to the hotel. And unfortunately, Jod Gunter would never live to see the day when his dream became a reality. He died shortly after the deal was signed, Mm. but his co-investors decided to name the hotel in his honor. Oh, wow. So the Vans family finally relinquished ownership in 1907 when the newly formed San Antonio Hotel Company made their purchase. Mrs. Mary Vans was paid $190,000, which today would be $6,205,844. That is a nice check. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take it. I mean, what did she do with all that? I don't know. She was like, I'm out. That's what I would do. I would go straight to the beach Mm -hmm. and disappear. Yeah, I'm sure she did. Yeah. I don't blame her. She did good. The hotel group renovated and they added floors. It was now eight stories tall and 301 rooms in total. That's pretty big. Yeah. The Gunter Hotel at the time was one of the finest and best hotels in the country. And then in 1917, they added a ninth floor. And I think as of today, there are 12 floors. It's amazing it's still standing. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Well, lots of celebrities stayed at the Gunter Hotel throughout the 20th century. President Truman and John Wayne, who stayed at the Gunter during the filming of his movie, The Alamo. The Alamo was down the street from the hotel. At the time, the Gunter was the place to be. Everybody wanted to be at the Gunter. So by 1979, the Gunter Hotel sold again, and the $20 million restoration was undertaken. And 10 years later, the Gunter found a new home with the Sheraton Hotel chain. And then it changed hands again for the next 10 years. And in 1999, after an $8 million renovation, it once more became a member of the Sheraton Hotel family and remains so today. So while the Sheraton Gunter today is one of the most stayed in hotels in San Antonio, the 1960s brought a different sort of notoriety to the hotel, the gruesome kind. Oh, not the good kind. No. And as well as the ghosts that still haunt this hotel. And it's a perfect location in downtown San Antonio. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures. It looks like old money Mm -hmm. for sure. It looks kind of plain on the outside. Mm -hmm. But the inside is gorgeous. I think they try to keep some of the old charm. Mm -hmm. Neat. So like many haunted locations in San Antonio, people staying at the Gunter Hotel say they have seen the spirits of the fallen Alamo defenders. There have been reported dips in temperature, you know, the kind where your hair stands up and you get a chill down your spine. Mm. Others have experienced the sensation of being watched 
And I'm sure you've had that too before. Oh, yeah. When you kind of look over your shoulder with the expectation that someone is there, but they never are. Ugh. So I want to talk about the two flapper ladies. Okay. Two flappers are said to haunt the halls of the Sheraton Gunter Hotel, or they're believed to be flappers from the 1920s. And others say that maybe they were sex workers from the same period. The first spirit who had been given the name Ingrid is often seen wearing a long white dress while she wanders along the upper floors of the hotel. And the second is called Peggy. And I want you to know that those two women do not get along. Oh my gosh. They don't get along at all. Now, the women are set to haunt opposing sections of the hotel. Guests have reported hearing them heatedly argue, but nobody knows what they're arguing about. What are they arguing about? May, is it territory or did they know each other in life and their arguments have continued into the afterlife? That'll be me. Yeah, because <laughs> you're petty like that. <laughs> I am. Wow, that's so interesting. So do they know who these ghosts are in mm -mm. real life? They just named them yeah. what they are. Interesting how they've shown up enough times mm -hmm. and enough people know. Like they have characteristics. They're petty too. <laughs> I mean, I feel like whatever kept them there, their activity is pretty obvious to most people, I guess. And guests actually have taken pictures, of, like selfies, or had somebody else take pictures of them at the hotel. And when they look at the pictures or get them developed, the girls are in the picture too, kind of like they want to be part of the fun. Oh. They have been spotted in pictures. Wow. There have been sounds and evidence of furniture being moved in guest rooms as well as in the common areas of the hotel when no one is around. That's terrifying. Well, these two have been arguing for like, what, a hundred years? Like, ma'am. <laughs> right. Get over your squabble. I mean, raise your words, not your voice. So probably tons of paranormal investigators have been there. Been through there. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrifying. Well, and then there is one of the most famous celebrities to stay at the Gunther was the blues artist Robert Johnson. Johnson's talent scout had arranged for a recording session at the hotel on November 23rd, 1936 in room 414. But in this strange twist of fate, it would be only one of two recording sessions that Robert Johnson would ever have. Johnson was one of the most important and influential blues musicians of his day. He was so good that some people thought that Johnson had made a deal with the devil at the crossroads to earn all the success that he had in such a short period of time. Oh, wow. So in 1938, at the age of 27, Johnson was found dead near Greenwood, Mississippi, and the cause of his death was unknown and is still up and unsolved and up for speculation. And some people believe that he had been poisoned. At the hotel? No. So, so which is interesting, no. In Mississippi, he had his eye on a woman, and she gave him a bottle of whiskey to drink. And his friend was like, don't drink out of it. Never drink out of a bottle you didn't, like you didn't see opened. Yeah. And Johnson was like, mm, back off. I'll do me. And he drank it. And then he died three days later. He got really sick, and then he died. So they think he was poisoned, but not at the hotel. However, as the story goes... It is said that Johnson's spirit, though, however, still lingers in room 414 at the Sheraton Gunter Hotel. Some people say they can hear faint jazz music playing. It's coming from somewhere, but they don't know where. And in 2009, musician John Mellencamp 
stayed at the Gunter to record a new album. Apparently, people go there to have recording sessions. So I guess I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Did Robert Johnson stay in the hotel? Yes. Okay. He did have a recording session there in room 414. Okay. But then he checked out and went to Mississippi, and that's where he died. Gotcha. Okay. So musician John Mellencamp stayed at the Gunter to record a new album, too. He said he had felt drawn, actually, to the hotel and room 414 in particular. Like, he's like, I had this feeling I had to stay at this hotel. And today, actually, the Gunter's new bar is honored with the name. It's called Room 414 in reference to the room that Johnson, you know, stayed in. That's really neat. I see they, a picture. They used to at least have a display of him in the lobby. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they still do, but that's kind of neat. Yeah, I guess he was super famous hmm. in the 30s. Yeah, so in February of 1965, San Antonio's largest unsolved mystery would take place at the Gunter Hotel. Oh, my goodness. Albert Knox checked in on February 6th. He was a blonde man, and it was said he was really, really handsome. A charmer, really. According to some... Knox was coming off a drinking binge, and according to others, Knox was kind of still in the thick, in the middle of that partying run, that drinking binge. Right. And just hanging out until he sobered up to go back to his parents' house. So for two days, guests of the Gunter saw Albert Knox come and go with a tall, beautiful, sophisticated woman. People called her a call girl, but, you know, nobody really knew who she was. That's probably why they called her that, because they didn't didn't know who she was. Well, she was super classy, very beautiful. But on February 8th, one of the hotel's housekeepers was bringing some items to Knox's hotel room, room 636. Maria Luisa Guerra noted the do not disturb sign on the door, but paid it no attention. She went in anyway. Rude. Yeah, only to walk in and Albert Knox was standing at the foot of the bed with a bloody bundle Mm. in his arms. Blood splattered every inch of the room, like every inch. Looking at Maria's horrified expression, Knox lifted one finger up to his mouth. Shh. (gasps) That's terrifying. Yeah, she like opened her mouth to scream and Knox took advantage of that moment, ran past her and out of the room. It took about 40 minutes for Maria's report to make it to management and then to the police. And by that time, Albert Knox was gone. He disappeared. The evidence remaining in room 636 was clear. Somebody had died in that room. In a 1976 interview about the crime, Detective Walter Corky Dennis, who passed away in 2011, worked that case back then in 65, said that it was the bloodiest place I had ever seen up until then. The bathroom was especially bad and just sticky with blood all over the place. I noticed the bathtub had a red ring around it, like it was filled with blood and then drained. Okay, so Albert was the only one murdered in that room? No, Albert was murdered. Albert ran away. He murdered somebody. Oh, he murdered someone. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, you said he was like holding... Holding a bloody bundle. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And he was just standing there when housekeeper walked in. Yeah, I thought maybe he was wounded or something. Oh, trying mm-hmm. to hold something in. And he said, shh, because I thought he somebody was standing there with a gun or something oh, at him. Oh, okay. So, well, she was getting ready to scream. And I think he was just trying to, like, shush her or whatever. Right. Because oh. it was him and he would have been in trouble. Right. Okay. Yeah, I took that the wrong way. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he hightailed out of there and disappeared. 
Okay. The authorities kind of think that he murdered the woman with his 22 caliber gun. He then butchered the body and flushed her down the toilet and the tub. And we'll talk about it a little bit here in a minute. So were there any body remnants visible in the room? Not really. Okay. The San Antonio police suspected dismemberment, and one of the witnesses actually confirmed their suspicion even more. So the day before the murder, Knox went to a local Sears in search of a meat grinder. Mm. And when the Sears employee informed him that they didn't have the larger size that he wanted, the employee offered to order one from the warehouse. But for Knox, however, that would take too much time. He didn't have time and he stormed off. Now, little evidence was found in the room, a lipstick smeared cigarette, brown paper bags, luggage from the San Antonio Trunk and Gift Company. The purchase for the suitcase had been made by a check from John J. McCarthy, who happened to be the stepfather of 37-year-old Walter Emmerich, who had disappeared on one of his drinking binges at the end of January and had stolen his parents' checks and some of their items. So Knox is his fake name. Oh. His name is Walter Emmerich. So police, of course, they search the city for the woman's body because everybody is like, yeah, he's, for the last two days, he's been with this woman and they were looking for him. I mean, they were so sure that she was murdered Yeah, in that room and he dumped her somewhere or whatever. Right. And uh, they checked construction sites and even sections of streets where cement was being laid down. I mean, they checked everywhere. And on February 9th, a blonde man walked into the St. Anthony Hotel, which is just a block away from the Gunter. Mm -hmm. He came with no luggage. And when he requested to book a room, he made it clear that he wanted room 636. But that particular room was not available. And after some arguing, he settled for room 536. And he checked in under the name Roger Ashley. But the front desk clerk was kind of suspicious. It's like, you're weird. You're asking for room 636 when just a murder happened down the street in room 636 and called the police and tipped them off that the murderer might have just checked into their hotel. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So the detectives rushed over there and they hurried up to room 536 and banging on the door the police tried to arrest Walter Emmerich for the murder of the unidentified woman. But as they struggled to open the door, they heard the sound of a gunshot. <gasps> and Walter Emmerich had killed himself and taken pretty much whatever information he had with him. He didn't leave a note, nothing. Oh, Absolutely nothing. I hate that. It's terrible. And in the almost 60 years that have passed since that night, the woman's identity has still never been discovered. No missing persons reports have ever surfaced. Nothing. But a few years ago, and this is so weird, a few years ago, the general manager of the Gunter received an envelope with no return address. And it was addressed to the Gunter, not the Sheraton Gunter. And the zip code dated back to 1965. And inside the envelope was an old room key, yeah. the one for room 636. I just got chills. And it was the kind they used back in the 60s. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that weird? Wow. Somebody knew something. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe that woman wasn't murdered. Maybe they both murdered somebody. And she still had a key and mailed it in. I don't know. No one really knows. But many people have witnessed the murder replay in the years since then at the hotel. Staff and guests 
guests both have reported paranormal phenomena. One guest even witnessed seeing a ghostly woman who held her hands out and just stared at the guest. Yeah. Come here or help me. I don't know. So when the San Antonio Paranormal Investigations conducted one of its many investigations at the Sheraton Gunter, one of their psychics was actually physically attacked by an unseen force. Now that is scary. That is terrifying. I don't mind seeing two flapper girls argue, but yeah, being attacked by something you can't see. Mm -mm. scares the shit out of me. Yeah, so I don't know. Is it possible that the ghosts of Walter Emmerich and his unknown victim are replaying the brutal murder in the afterlife? Is that what people see? No one is sure, but this can be said. If you hope to stay in room 636, the hotel's most recent renovation has actually split the haunted room into two separate guest rooms now. So if you go... I wish you the best of luck. Oh, that just, oh, I bet because they probably get so many requests yeah. for that room. So, but I wish they wouldn't have touched it. I wish they would have left it as it was. Well, I am sure this is part of the reason why the Sheraton Gunter is the most visited hotel. Oh, I'm sure. It sounds like it's still a pretty active hotel. Yeah. And kind of in the middle of everything still. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's crazy, Claudia. I just thought it was interesting because I used to work for Marriott. And when I took my parents down to San Antonio, we stayed at the Marriott. And I've never gone inside the Gunther, but I know where it is. But I didn't know the history about it either. And the Marriott I stayed at in San Antonio is just a little bit down the street from the Gunther. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, neat. So I thought, oh, I had no idea about this hotel. None whatsoever. I have been to San Antonio and I've seen the Alamo. Mm -hmm. like, that whole area is beautiful. Absolutely. The river walk. Yes. Ugh. It's really something yeah. to see. A lot of rich history in that area. Yeah. But also, from what it sounds like... You can't have all that blood everywhere and not have killed someone. Right. And what did he have? Like the bloody bundle. Was it the remnants? Well, I'm trying to think of other cases where they flushed it down the toilet and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Wasn't one of them Nielsen? He had a plumber come and the plumber ended up getting all body parts and flesh out of the sewer. That had to be... Okay, like a meat grinder and that whole process, and I'm not trying to be desensitized because the whole thing is disgusting. Mm -hmm. I, when I go to a hotel, I can hear my neighbors yeah. sneeze. Right. So how are you doing this? How are you doing a meat grinder at midnight? Well, I mean, you turn it. No, I mean like, and not be, and it's not loud. So those are crank ones that mm -hmm. are quiet. Yeah. Well, not quiet, quiet, but quieter than Today. the electric ones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like he dismembered her body in the bathtub, drained her, and mm. that's what the police think because there's really no evidence wow. in that room left. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, that key. That is scary. Somebody is holding that secret. That is terrible. Somebody knows. Somebody knows something. That's really a great case, Claudia. <laughs> Good job. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please join us every Friday. We release new episodes for Judgy After Dark. Mm-hmm. And you can join for just $3 every month. It supports the show. We are a very small podcast. And so it helps keep us going. Yeah, definitely. If you follow us on Facebook, which I'm sure you already do, but definitely check us out and join us for a Facebook Live True Crime Trivia Night on Monday, October 30th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We will be giving you all of the spooky trivia 
that you'll love for Halloween. It'll be a lot of fun. Definitely join us. And are we giving anything away? We are. I'm glad you asked. Mm -hmm. We are going to be giving away a month of our Judgy After Dark cases. Definitely tune in so that you can grab some of those. Judgy After Dark for a month. You'll love it. You really, really will. Yeah, we have a lot of episodes out already that you can catch up on. Mm -hmm. Definitely join us for the trivia. So stay sassy. Stay judgy. And stay tuned in with the Judgy Crime Girls. Okay, we love you. Bye. Bye.